Awesome. Well, good evening. I'm sure we know, as we know, Pastor Rawls in Mexico right now. He's at a pastor's conference. So please keep him in prayer. He'll be back tomorrow. He did ask me to step in for him. And what a blessing it is to be able to just give you the word here tonight. And uh, speaking of blessings, if you do have your Bibles, turn to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. And let's open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you now, Lord, and we thank you so much, Lord, for the work that you've done here in this place. Lord, we ask that you continue to magnify yourself, exalt yourself in this place. Lord, I pray, Father, that your word go forth in power. I pray that you speak to us here tonight loud and clear, Lord, that you give us a a sensitivity to your Holy Spirit. Lord, that we may hear from you, prepare our hearts, I pray that you speak to each one of us here individually. Lord, may my words be few. May I decrease, may you increase here tonight. And I just pray, Father, that you bless this night, that you bless the message, and that you bless every single one of us here in this place. And we ask this in your most precious holy name, we pray. Amen. All right, Psalms chapter 1. The title of my message today is The Person that God blesses, the person that God blesses. And the Lord placed this message really heavy on my heart today because of what it means to me, this chapter, of what it personally really means to me in my life. And I remember the earlier days of my salvation back when I first gave my life back to the Lord. Uh, He gave me a promise as I read through this chapter, through Psalm 1. He gave me a promise here, and I was reading it when I was reading it I was seeking him, and I was asking, Lord, what is it that you want to do with me? Here I am, Lord. What do you want to do with my life? I want to do your will. And I remember clear as day, the words he gave me in this chapter were, delight in me, and I will bless you. Delight in me, and I will bless you. And I kept hearing that. And I'm like, okay, what does this mean? What do I do? And, and, and so I began to read more and more, and, and when I began to ask, the same response was, trust in me, wait on me, and I will bless you. And I can honestly say that God has been, to this day, faithful to keep his promise in my life, and I believe he, is, he will always be faithful, even in your lives. And I'm sure you've seen God's faithfulness in your own life. And so I realized that as I was reading through Psalms 1, I realized that there's a type of person that God blesses. And there's a type of person that God curses. So I want to share with you this promise that God gave me, because this promise is meant for all of us. It's meant for all those who follow Christ, for all those who are uh, committed, who all those who are in Christ, the promise of blessings, the promise to bless you. And I'm sure uh, we all know that God desires to bless us, right? And if you're here today and you don't know, or you don't know that, that God has this desire to bless you, I want you to know that God truly desires to bless you exceedingly abundantly more than you can ask or think. He has incredible blessings for your life. And we see from the very beginning of creation, God desired to bless mankind. When he created Adam and Eve, his desire was to bless them abundantly. And it, it, it has always, and it's, it always will be God's desire that we should enjoy his blessings. But what happened? Sin entered the world through who? Through Adam and his disobedience. And sin hindered the blessings of God in our lives. And it does to this very day. Sin will hinder God's blessings in our lives. And it was only after Adam's disobedience, only after sin entered the world, that we see the word cursed. Cursed. Genesis 3, 4, uh, 14, God said to Adam, because you have done this, you are cursed. Because, Adam, you have disobeyed me, you are cursed. You are cursed. 
And so God cursed mankind. However, today there is a way that we can enjoy, that we can receive God's blessings in our lives. And how do you define God's blessing in your life? How do you, what does it mean to you to be blessed by God? What is a blessing from God? Is it the material things of this world? Living maybe a lavish lifestyle, winning the lottery, is, is, is that a blessing? I mean, don't get me wrong, th- those, th- those sound like great blessings, but the blessings that God desires to give you, the, 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 these, the, these blessings are spiritual blessings that he wants to give you. Ephesians 1, 3 tells us that the believer in Christ has been blessed with all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. So what about hearing the voice of God? What about the blessing of fellowship with our creator? What about uh, receiving a word of prophecy or word of wisdom and seeing it come to pass and wow, God gave me that. God gave me that and I saw it come to. What about answered prayer in our lives? The blessing of answered prayer. What about having peace that although you don't understand, you have peace? That that is only from God. What about the good fruit that comes from your life? The, The blessing of being a blessing to others. It's more blessed to give than to receive, right? You see, these are the blessings that we need to look forward to. These are the blessings that we should desire in our lives because there is nothing more fulfilling. There is nothing more fulfilling in our life apart from God's blessings. And he wants you to enjoy them. And it's sad that honestly many Christians today, they don't possess these spiritual bless, these blessings, these, these riches we have in Christ. Many Christians don't possess them. Maybe because compromise. There's compromise in their lives or maybe because the desires of their heart is wrong. What are the desires of your heart? What, what is it that you delight in? What is your delight? Are they for me, myself, and I? Are they to to bring myself glory or is it to bring glory and honor to God? What is that desire? Because if your desire is to honor him, if your desire is to bring him glory, then you better believe that he's gonna bless you with these desires. He's gonna give you exceedingly abundantly more. Psalms 37, four, if you delight in the Lord, He will what? Give you the desires of your heart. What are the desires of your heart? Me, myself, and I? Or are they for the glory of God? And so examine your hearts today. What is your desire? Because I promise you that if if your heart is right and your, your delight is in God, he will begin to use your life in a way that you've never imagined. And maybe he has already. But if you're, if you're seeking God's will for your life, it's simple. Delight in me and I will bless you. And these are the blessings that I want us to consider today that if you, if you truly desire them as we go through Psalms 1. And so what kind of person does God give these blessings to? As I mentioned we will see this contrast in Psalms 1 between the person that God blesses and then the person that God curses. Which side do you want to be on? Our key verse is, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Verse 6. So first, we're going to see that God blesses a person who sets themselves apart from the world. Holiness. Holiness means to be set apart. God says, 
Be holy, for I am holy. To be set apart from this world, this uh, God-rejecting society that we live in. We have to live a life of holiness. So notice, let's begin verse 1. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Blessed is the man who is not conformed to this world, who has no love for this world, who is set apart from this world. Notice here we see three things that a Christian should do in order to set themselves apart. First, there is a way that we cannot walk. There is a way we do not walk, and that is the way of what? Ungodliness ungodly thinking. Paul says in Ephesians 4.1, he says, instead, walk worthy of your calling. Walk worthy of the calling which you were called. And if you are here, I believe that God has placed a call on your life. Are you walking worthy to that call? Because the, the, the life of a Christian is based on, on, on a walk, on this walk. And the person that God blesses they're careful in the way they walk. They're careful in the way they walk, speaking of the way you think. The way you're thinking that although we are in this world, we are not of this world. Physically, we're in this world. Spiritually, we're not of this world. We are not of this world. We do not think as this world does. Before we were in Christ, we did. Notice Ephesians 4, 17, Paul says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Notice, in the futility of their mind, the way you think. You see, the ungodly have counsel. They have counsel, and there's so much advice that comes from, to us from so many different sources, news, TV, the government, media, social media, your friends, and even your family sometimes give ungodly advice. But the righteous man knows how to stay away from this counsel. A righteous person will know how to discern bad counsel from good counsel, and, and, and sadly, so many of us fail at this. We fail because we don't consider whether we are hear, what we are hearing is good or, or bad counsel sometimes. We don't consider it, and so how do we learn to discern? How, how, how do we know where to find godly counsel? Psalms 119, 24 says, your testimonies are what? My delight. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. Notice the word of God is always the best counselor. Any godly counselor, any pastor, especially here in this church, should always point to the word of God when giving counsel. Even if you give counsel, it should always be bi biblical. It should always be from the authority that God has given us. Be careful of any counsel that is given apart from God's word. Discern, know whether is this of God or is this not of God? Should I receive this? Should I apply it or should I not? Because a, a, a godly person will only receive counsel from the word of God because it is the word of truth. And, and, and we know that here today. It is our authority, and I thank God for the teachings that he's given me through this place, through our pastors, Pastor Raul, who does not compromise from the word of God, and, and that's why we love this place, because he speaks truth. He never, ever uh, gives a sermon apart from God's word. 
And second, notice there is a path that we do not stand. Sinners have a path where they stand, speaking of a road, a direction that they are going, what the wide and broad road that leads to what? Destruction. There is this road that the sinner is on, but the righteous person knows that they do not belong on that path. We don't belong on that road. Right? I hope we all know that here today. We are not going in the same direction that that the ungodly are going, that the sinner is going, and, and that road is wide, unfortunately. The righteous, what do we do? We live a life of true repentance before God. What does repentance mean? It means doing a 180 and going the opposite direction from the direction you were going. You were on this path to destruction, but you've repented, you said, you know what, I don't like this path. I'm going the way Jesus is going. I'm going the direction that Jesus is going, which is what? The direction that leads us to eternal life. We're not doing the things that we used to do anymore. And this godly path is a very narrow path. It's narrow and not many walk on it. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 14, that narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. Yes, it is difficult but we are more than conquerors in Christ. Philippians 4.13, we can do all things through Christ. Don't let the, the, this difficulty be an excuse in, in your life. Don't say it's impossible for me to give up this sin. I can't, it's too hard. It's impossible. Do you not serve a God that does the impossible? And you know, you have to be willing to surrender it. God's not going to do it for you. When I hear that excuse, my response is always, is it, is it really difficult or you just don't desire to let it go you, because you delight in it? Because if you delighted more in God, guess what? I'm a living example. I had addictions that I no longer have because I, I want to set myself apart. And so the blessed man is, is, is the man who is not afraid or, or ashamed to take this narrow, this less popular road, because he knows it leads to what? Blessings, joy, eternal life. And third, there is a seat that we do not sit in, the seat of what? The scornful. Those who scorn, the, the scornful, they love to sit and they love to mock and they love to ridicule the, the people of God and the things of God. And it, it, it's so easy to sometimes just sit and act the same way. It is, it, it's easy. It's easy because there are, are many things to mock the Christian for, really our faith, our values, our beliefs. Oh, you're telling me you believe that God flooded the world for 40 days? Nonsense. Like, they, they, they'll scorn. Yeah, I, we believe that. That is the God we serve. Maybe you're afraid to speak up. Maybe you're afraid to defend the faith. Maybe you're ashamed. Paul says... For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. And you know, maybe even as Christians, we act arrogant, we act, we mock each other, we gossip sometimes uh, because maybe we don't meet each other's standards of living, but the righteous person knows that we are not to sit on that seat because it's wrong. 
We're not to sit on the seat of the scornful. Instead, we should be proud to follow Christ no matter the ridicule or the mockery towards us. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He says, be out and out for Christ. Unfurl your colors, never hide them, but nail them to the mast and say to all who ridicule the saint, if you have any ill words for the followers of Christ, pour them out upon me. Pour them out, but know this, that you shall always hear it, whether you like it or not, that I love Christ. You will always hear that, no matter what you say against my faith, my belief. And second, God blesses the person who delights in his word, who delights in it. Let me ask you, how important is God's word in your life, how important is it? Again, what is your delight? What is it that you desire? What is it that you desire every day? What is it that you desire most? I ask this because unless you delight in God's word, you will not know how to discern ungodly counsel. You will stand in the path of sinners. You will sit in the seat of scornful. The, the, those who scorn, if, you, if you're not in the word of God, if you don't delight in it. So notice verse two, it says, but, but his delight, the blessed person's desire is in the law of the Lord and in his law, he meditates what? Day and night. Notice those who God blesses, they don't delight in what, in what pertains to sin and ungodliness, they delight in God's word. They abide in the word of Christ. Do you, do you want to know if you are a true disciple of Jesus? You want to know how? He says in John 8, 31, if you abide in my word, you are my disciple indeed. You are my disciple. The word of God is the word of Christ because Christ is God. And notice the law of the Lord here describes the entirety of God's word, not just the Torah and not just the law portion of the first five books. David here speaks of the entire word of God, Old and New Testament. And so what the the righteous man delights in the entire word of God, even if you don't understand what you're reading, you you just delight in it. You know what, I'm gonna keep reading and I'm gonna wait on the Lord just to see what he gives me. You delight in it. And so ask yourself, what makes you happy? What gets you excited? What is it that you love to do? Examine your heart because if your answer is anything apart from God, then you are failing, excuse me, you're falling short of the, the, the blessings of God in your life. If your delight is in anything else in this world, any of your possessions, finances, you're falling short of God's blessing in your life. And listen, don't just read God's word to read it because, oh man, I I have to. Read it because you delight in it. Read it because you love it. You gotta have it. You gotta have it. The other day, um, um, on Memorial Day, I went with my wife and her family to, um, to Victoria Gardens. And before we left, uh, gosh, I hope Rawl doesn't get mad at me for saying this story. But before we left, we wanted to get ice cream. And, and I, I found out and I, I realized, wow, Rawl really loves ice cream. And I'm, like, I'm like, we go to Cold Stone. You know how they have three sizes? The I like it, the I love it, the gotta have it. Guess what he got? The gotta have it. And before I, I could look twice, it was gone. But I'm going too far. And so he, he, I, that's how I realized that he loved ice cream because he had to have it. And so, so my point is that if a person delights in something, you don't have to ask them to do it. You don't have to convince them to like it. 
They, they, they just got to have it. God's word, you got, you got to have it. And yet how sad that God at times what must plead with us is to spend time with them. Put me first, please. Spend time with me. I feel like I'm speaking to myself here sometimes because there are times when I, when I fall short of this. I feel God knocking, reminding me see, to seek him, reminding me that I, I need to spend time with him, but I get so caught up with everything else that I, I fail to spend time with him. You, you ever get that feeling of emptiness? When was the last time you read the word? Was it today, this morning, I hope? Was it last week? Do you, do you not feel an emptiness the more you go without the word of God in your life? My wife told me this the other day, um, actually a while back, when we, after we got married, we were moving into our new place and this really, it, it really hit me. She's like, we were, we were busy moving in, and it, was, it felt like it was never ending. And she said, man, I'm frustrated. I'm like, great, here we go again. What, what's wrong? She's like, I'm frustrated. I'm like, what, what, what's wrong? What happened? She said, I felt like I haven't been able to spend time with God. I felt like I haven't been able to be in my word, and I was like, man, you're right. It's frustrating. Maybe you are saying, I, I hear this a lot, I, I just, I don't have time. I don't have time to read his word. I don't have time to pray. But when I hear that, I, I always think, it's funny how, it's funny how we have time to do things we love, don't we, in our lives. But the things that we don't love, the things that we don't desire, we, we don't have time for. But everything else we, we have time for. But you, you know what? You'd be surprised how much time you actually do have and how much time God will give you to spend with him. Does he not control time? Not saying he's gonna stop time, because I would love that, but you'd be surprised. You just need to want it. You need to delight in the word of God. Notice David says, in his law, he meditates day and night. You see, the people of God were blessed, and God blesses us because we meditate on God's word. We don't just read the word. We study it. We memorize it. We ponder, we meditate on it. To ponder means to ponder, to seek, to understand what you are reading. What, what does this mean? How is it that I can apply this to my life? So you ponder it. How do I apply this, God, and show me what you want to say to me? allowing God's word to control and to transform your life. And notice how many times a day are we to have God's word on our mind? Only twice a day, all day and all night, twice a day. That's about it. It's not too hard, is it? And what are the results of delighting in God's word? bringing me to my third, the, the third person that God blesses is a person who is planted by the rivers of water. Planted. This is where we begin to see all the spiritual blessings in our life. We've, we've separated ourselves from the world. We, we've meditated on the word of God, and now we plant ourselves by the rivers of water, the righteous person, uh, their life begins to bear fruit. Notice verse three. 
It says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season and whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. Have you ever seen a tree planted by the rivers of water? Have you ever seen a tree that's planted you know, by a river or water? They are the most beautiful, the strongest, the, 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 the most stable, deep-rooted trees. Why? Because it has a continual source of water. It's always getting what it needs. It's always receiving what it needs. Do you ever feel needy at times? Do you lack a a deep inner fulfillment in your life, always desiring more and never really satisfied with what you have? And you're always tempted by the the lust of the eye. I, I need more in my life to be happy. Maybe then it's, it's worth examining whether you are planted by the rivers of water. Because you see, the Christian here is compared to a tree that is consistently getting what it needs. He no longer needs or desires a life outside of the will of God. He has found true fulfillment and satisfaction in God, and he has all he needs with God. He has everything he needs. Remember John 4, when after Jesus spoke with the Samaritan woman, his disciples came back and said, here, Jesus, eat some food. He's like, no, I'm good. They're like, where'd you get food? What, what do you mean? He's like, my food is to do the will of God the will of him who sent me and to finish the work. He's like, that is my, that is my, my uh, satisfaction. That is my food to do the will of God. And so where do we find these waters? How do we draw from these rivers of waters? Notice Jesus says in John 7, 37 through 38, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Notice he says to the Samaritan woman in John 4, and whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus is our source of water, our living water, and we are to be planted and rooted in him. It is only when we abide in him that we become planted by the rivers of living water, always getting what we need. When we are planted, when we abide in him, when you abide in him, if you haven't researched the word abide, if you haven't studied it, I recommend you do. I'm not gonna give you the definition, but I go home, study what it means to abide. Don't just Google it, study it, memorize it ponder it, meditate on it. Notice you become a tree that brings forth its fruit and you begin to produce good fruit in your life. Notice Jesus says in John 15, four through five, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. You, you, You cannot produce good fruit in your life if you are not attached to the vine. If you are not attached to Christ, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing, literally. Literally, you can do nothing without Christ. And it's funny the, the mercy, the long suffering, the, the grace of God, that people curse the name of Jesus 
and yet he gives them breath. Their heart still beats because those are muscles you cannot control. There are muscles you can control, but you cannot control your heartbeat. When you sleep, you can't control your breathing. Guess who controls them? God, Jesus. He says, apart from me, you would have no breath. You had no heartbeat. And that is what, what hell is. It's literally being apart from Christ forever. That is what hell is. As, just as um, darkness is the absence of light, hell is the absence of Christ, of God. And you see, the, the believer who draws upon the spiritual life in Christ will be fruitful, and they're going to be victorious in their Christian walk, and they're going to experience some of the greatest blessings that you've ever experienced in your life. And so the righteous man bears much fruit. What kind of fruit? Apples, figs, grapes? No. You see, when the Bible speaks of fruit, it is used as a metaphor to describe the produce of a person's life. Fruit can either be good or it can be bad. Notice what Jesus says in Luke 6, 43 through 45. He says, for a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. Notice, a good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good and an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Notice, fruit is the direct result of whatever controls our heart. Whatever controls your heart. What do you delight in that controls your heart? Jesus? your finances, your car. So when you abide in Jesus, you begin to naturally, spontaneously produce good fruit in your life. There is nothing that the branch has to offer the vine. It simply abides. It simply is like, I'm just going to be attached here and receive whatever the vine wants to give me. <laughs> That's it. There's no striving there is no striving in Jesus. It's simply abiding. I might have already given you the definition, but... So the good fruit is, notice Galatians 5, through 23, but the fruit of the Spirit, the good fruit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Do you see that fruit in your life? Do you see that coming out of your life? Or is, is the kind of fruit in your life, Galatians 5, 19 through 20, sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissension, divisions, envy, murders, drunkenness. Drunkenness. Any of those coming out of your life? Those are the signs that show whether you are, whether you are not abiding in Christ. The fruit. He, he, he continues, the, 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 the branch that does not bear good fruit, the father is the vine dresser. He will cut it off, and guess what? It is only good for the fire. It is only good for the fire. So notice the person who sets himself apart from this world. The person who delights in God's word, who abides in Christ, planted by the waters, whatever he does, he shall prosper. He shall prosper. You will have victory. You will have blessings in your life from God. Blessings that you never even imagined that, that I would not trade one blessing for God, uh, from God for all the, the treasures this world has to offer. One of God's blessings is greater than anything 
this world has to offer. This is the person who will experience all of God's spiritual blessings in their life. Now for the contrast, we see the person who God curses. Verse four, the ungodly are not so. Notice, this means that all the godly person enjoys, everything that the godly person experiences is the complete opposite for the ungodly. It's the complete opposite. Verse four again, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. They are chaff. The godly people, they're, they're, were, were compared to a tree that is strong, stable. It is useful. It's beautiful. It's alive. It's fruitful. But the ungodly, they're compared to what? to the chaff. What happens? What is chaff? Well, in, in wheat, in the grain of wheat, there's this little shell around the grain of wheat. And in order to separate the chaff from the wheat, they, they throw it up in the air. And the wind and the air catches this chaff and it separates it. That is the ungodly. Who is, who's the wheat? The Christian who does not compromise. And then the chaff, the ungodly will just gone. They have no roots. They have no weight. They're just blown away with the wind and they are useless in the plans of God. And at times it may seem that the ungodly are blessed. Sometimes it seems that they are more blessed than the righteous. But what? It is not so. It is not so. Any and all of the things in the life of a person apart from Christ will just blow away in the wind. I love this saying, we only have one life to live and it shall soon be past. Give yourself 100 years. It'll soon be past, but it is only what's done for Christ that will last. Only what is done for Christ that will not blow away. Psalms 37, do not fret because of evildoers who prosper in their ways. The little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of the wicked. Way better. I wouldn't trade what I am doing now for anything. Notice the, the dangerous future of the ungodly. Verse five, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Notice the, there, there's two judgments. There's the, the, the Bema seat of Christ judgment where the righteous will be judged, where we're all gonna stand before Christ and we're gonna give an account of ourselves and whatever comes out of the fire is going to be our reward. If nothing comes out, your only reward is eternal life. That's the beam of seed of Christ's judgment. But this is not the judgment that the ungodly will stand in. There's a second judgment. It's called the white throne judgment. That is where the, the ungodly will be judged prior to being cast into the lake of fire. This is a judgment that the ungodly and the sinners will stand in because remember, the ungodly, they're like chaff. They have no weight. They will be found wanting on the day of judgment, just like God said to King Belshazzar in Daniel. He said, you have been weighed in the balances, and guess what? You have been found wanting. What's your weight? Are you, are, you group, are you rooted and are you grounded in Christ that nothing can separate you? And so the ungodly and sinners, they will not share in the same glorious future of the righteous, which is also true now. They may look blessed, but the ungodly and the sinner will never share in the riches of God's spiritual blessings. They can't. God can't bless someone who's in, uh, who's, who, who's in sin. Remember, what caused God's blessings to turn into curses? 
disobedience, sin, will hinder God's blessings in your life. Remember, our righteousness, it, it, it's not our own. It is not our righteousness. Being a, cur- a, a good person does not make you a righteous person. Many are confused. They say, oh, well, I'm a good person. No, that, says, that doesn't make you righteous or godly. We are all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God, but God who is what? Rich in mercy because of his great love with which he had for us even when we were dead in sin. What did he do? Make us alive together in who? In Christ. It's by grace, not by ourselves, not, not, not of ourselves, only by grace, the free gift of God. And it is only with the righteousness of Christ It is only in Christ that we have a life and any kind of future, a glorious future in God's kingdom. It is only in Christ and God knows who his people are. He knows the righteous and those who have truly accepted Jesus in their lives. Notice verse six, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And this is how the righteous, this is how we can have peace in our lives. Why? Because we know that we have a loving God who, in, who is in heaven and who he, he knows our way and he will protect and he will preserve us for eternity. What is the path that you're on? Does God know you? You can't hide from God. You can't play games with God. He knows your heart. He knows, you see, the Lord knows who, truly who, who, who belongs to him. The, the word know, it means so much more than our mental understanding indicates when we say, for example, we know each other. That's not how God knows us. The idea of God, of God knowing us, it speaks of choosing and being cared for. He knows the righteous. He cares for the righteous. He knows our hearts, so he will care for us. Jesus is our true shepherd, right? He says in John 14, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd did what? He gave his life for the sheep, showing that he cares for us. No greater love. There's no greater love. And if you're here today and and you're asking God to prove his love for you by giving you maybe the wrong desires you may have, there's no greater love than the cross. He did that because he cares for you. And he says, I know my sheep. I know the sheep that belong to me. He knows those who he has chosen, and he knows those who have chosen him. Examine your heart. Does does Jesus know who you are? Does he know who you are? Does he know you as one of his sheep? Will, Will he know you when you are in his presence? Will he say, come on in, thy good and faithful servant? Or is he going to say, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you ungodly, those who practice iniquity, those who practice lawlessness. You see, the ungodly, they, they perish because they willfully refuse to submit to Christ and his words willfully. We have the, 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 the freedom of choice and they choose to reject. God doesn't send anybody to hell. He desires all to come to repentance. Hell was not created for us, but for, the, the, for Satan and his demons. The Bible says that. Are you reading? Are you delighting in it? People perish because they willfully want to. They prefer the counsel of the ungodly over the whole counsel of God. 
They prefer the friendship of godless people over the congregation of the righteous. They spend their days meditating on sin instead of what? Meditating on God's word. They think they have security in their, in their maybe finances, whatever in this world. They think they have security on earth, but in reality, they are like chaff that will soon blow away. But this is not so for who? The righteous, the Christian. How do we practice righteousness? How can we inherit the richness of blessings in Christ? It begins with surrender, repenting, Lord, forgive me. I surrender to you. It's a, it's a daily surrender of all that we are and all that we have to him every single day. Lord, I, I'm, I'm, I'm dying to myself. Help me with this sin. I'm surrendering to you. It involves spending time in God's word, reading it, meditating upon it, delighting in it day and night. Joshua 1.8 says the same thing. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but yet you should meditate on it day and night, and only then will your ways become prosperous. It involves a life that is separated from the world. It doesn't mean isolate yourself, but separate yourself from its defilement. You're not, you don't have to isolate yourself. You, 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 set, you, don't, you don't partake. You don't, you don't become conformed to, to this world. You, you, you purpose in your heart that you will not defile yourself. I love that verse in Daniel. He purposed in his heart. It's a purposed heart. Daniel was a man of purpose. He was a man of prophecy blessings from God. He was a man of prayer. And because of that, he was able to purpose. Are we able to purpose in our hearts not to defile ourselves standing for righteousness in a wicked and perverse generation? It demands a life with deep, strong roots that are drawn upon the waters of life, the spirit of Jesus in our lives, abiding in him. Abiding in him and delighting in him. And in closing, I want to give you the opportunity. I want to give the opportunity to make this stand here today. Are you going to separate? You want to separate yourself from the world? You want to delight in the word of God? Do you want to be planted by the rivers of living water to make the decision? You have a choice. You have a decision to make to follow Jesus, committing your life to him, fully and completely accepting him as your Lord and Savior. If you are here for the first time, maybe you were invited. If you have not fully surrendered, if you have not given your life to the Lord, What does Jesus say? Confess me before man, and I will confess you before my Father in heaven. If you are ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. And as we play this worship, it's simple. Just stand. There is no shame. Maybe you need to recommit your life. Stand. Let's all just bow our heads. This is between you and the Lord. If God has spoken to you here tonight, if he has given you, you feel, if you feel your heart wanting to beat out of its chest, that is the heartbeat of God. That is the Holy Spirit saying, stand. Confess me before man.
And let's all just keep our heads bowed. Let's worship. And if you want to stand, stand. And we, I will pray for you.